PHs that you will earn by attending today's presentation and completing a training session based on today's webinar in your own workplace. Group leaders, for this webinar we do not need the attendee list, so you can ignore the instructions you received about that. We're very proud to present today's webinar, Helping Adolescents Overcome Issues Presented by Cancer, Techniques to Enable Adolescents to Express Themselves Throughout Cancer Treatment. Shelby Gosnell from Cure Search for Children's Cancer will introduce our speakers. Shelby, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and thank everyone for joining Cure Search for Children's Cancer and the Child Life Council for the first in our Child Life Specialist webinar series made possible with a generous grant from Ronald McDonald House Charities. Uh, today we'll be, we will discuss helping adolescents overcome issues presented by cancers. Uh, in this presentation, you will see an interview of two adolescent cancer survivors, learn about psychosocial issues that adolescents face, learn about coping through diagnosis and treatment, school reentry, life after treatment, and how to cope as a medical professional. Our goal is that you will be able to discuss issues that face adolescents and share how to best respond to them. We hope that you will share this information with other members of your organization. Today, you'll hear from O.J. Soller, uh, MD from University of Rochester Medical Center, Gabrielle Roberts, PhD from Advocate Children's Hospital, Tui Trin, MS, and CCLS from Children's Cancer Hospital at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and Jason Canner, DO from Advocate Children's Hospital. Thank you again for joining us, uh, and now I would like to introduce you to our two adolescent cancer survivors. Hello, I'm Zach Fuerberg. I am 26 years old. I was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia, or ALL, when I was just before my 13th birthday in 1999. Uh, I'm Tanya Lantek. I am 27 now, and I was diagnosed with acute promyelocytic leukemia, APL, when I was 16. When I was diagnosed, that someone would told me that it gets better, but it does not get better right away. And a lot of people did tell me um, that this would make me stronger and happier, and um, that really didn't feel true at the time, so it actually made me feel betrayed, like I wasn't having the right cancer experience I was supposed to be having. Um, and really, it's taken 10 years and it's still happening to figure out that it has been an experience that has made me grow and I'm grateful for it. But it takes a really long time, and I think I wish someone would have told me it's okay to be angry or sad or it's okay not to feel anything at all, and that there's a whole range of different inner emotions that people have. There's not one right way to feel. What would I wish that someone would have told me when I was diagnosed or going through treatment? I guess I was diagnosed right before my 13th birthday, and I was a typical sort of type A active uh, young kid. I love to play sports. So I think one thing, and it's hard to know from your parents' perspective, is to try to manage my own expectations. You know, right after I was diagnosed, I was ready the next day to go out and join my swim team again and play basketball in the fall, but, you know, little did I know I had to spend sort of the, left, the next two weeks in the hospital bed and I wasn't able to play uh, contact sports, and so I think that's tough as a 13-year-old kid, especially a boy, you know, really getting stopped in your tracks like that. So I think, um, you know, sort of managing my expectations from the beginning and uh, giving me sort of a clear uh, goal of what I can achieve and what I can't do while I'm undergoing treatment. Hello, I'm O.J. Saylor. I'm the Director of Psychosocial Oncology Program and the Long-Term Survivors Program at Golisano Children's Hospital in Rochester, New York. My job today is to review the various stages of adolescence to provide background for the rest of our presenters today. In watching the video clip that began this session, 
you've already gotten a sense of the different issues that are important to teens of various ages as they are challenged by cancer. As we review the developmental differences between younger and older teens, think about what Tanya and Zach identified as of most concern to them. We will be returning to them throughout the webinar for their experiences and insights. Next slide. Next slide. Adolescence is often divided into three stages. Early, ages 12 to 14 years, middle, 15 and 16 years, and late, 17 to 19 years. Please remember that although the ages are only approximate, each stage has its own special characteristics as the person develops physically and emotionally, especially with regard to relationships, identity formation, and autonomy or gaining independence. Next slide. Let's start with early adolescence. Puberty is defined as the time span during which adolescents reach sexual maturity and become capable of reproduction. Under normal circumstances, both boys and girls can experience the onset of puberty as early as age 10. But most commonly, this phenomenon begins between ages 12 and 14. In general, girls develop earlier and more quickly than boys, both physically and emotionally. The average early adolescent girl is developing secondary sexual characteristics, such as breasts and pubic and axillary hair. In addition, she either already has or will experience menarche, or the onset of menstruation. Her menses are likely to be irregular and non-ovulatory for a year or two. Of note, most growth occurs before menarche, and she is likely to grow only one to two inches after her period starts. The average early adolescent boy is also developing secondary sexual characteristics and is beginning his growth spur. With regard to relationships, both boys and girls tend to congregate in same-sex groups, although early boyfriend-girlfriend behaviors can be seen. The most pressing identity question during this stage of rapid physical change is, who am I as a physical person? Teens this age want to be like everyone else, and even small differences can lead to tears, tantrums, and social isolation. Autonomy is limited, and parental influence remains most important, especially during this stage. Certainly, as we listen to 13-year-old Zach, we will notice that his reliance on his parents is a prime example. Next slide. Middle adolescence tends to be marked by the most conflict with parents, especially the same-sex parent. Most of this stems from a growing desire for autonomy on the part of the teen and reluctance to relinquish control over potentially risky behaviors on the part of the parent. After all, mothers were once teenagers and remember the confusion and temptations of being a girl. And fathers were also once teenagers and remember the confusions and temptations of being a boy. This stage is also a time full of drama. Many attribute the rapid mood swings typical of this age to, quote, raging hormones, unquote, which likely do play a part in the teen's emotional volatility. With regard to pubertal change in girls, Breast development may be complete and ovulatory cycles established. Boys are likely moving into the period of their maximal growth spurt and muscular development is becoming pronounced. Relationships are characterized by strong friendship groups that still tend to be same sex. However, sexual experimentation is increasing. Romantic relationships are beginning to sort themselves into hetero, homo, or bisexual relationships. Identity formation can be summed up in the question, who am I as a sexual person? This is coupled with the drive to be the same embodied in the statement, I don't want to be different from everyone else. And you will hear 16-year-old Tanya say, I wanted to be treated as normal. 
Autonomy during this stage is also increasing. A driver's license or after-school job provide the means to expand the teen's sphere of potential friends and activities. As a result, we have the push-pull of parent and child and the increased possibility of daredevil or reckless behavior, especially when away from the family. It's important to remember the doctrine of the mature minor, which states that patients less than 18 years old can be full partners in healthcare decision making when there is evidence that the patient understands the consequences of his or her decisions. In fact, in some instances, the patient's desires can outweigh those of the parents. This doctrine of mature minor is a matter of state law and so varies geographically. However, it would be highly unusual for providers to not take the teen's wishes into consideration when helping the family make decisions about best management. You will hear Tanya clearly express her desire to be included in discussions and to be treated like an adult. Next slide. The late adolescent girl is fully sexually mature. In boys, growth may continue until the early 20s, and maximal strength is certainly often not achieved until the 20s. Relationships in both same and same sex and mixed sex groups are common. Sexual experimentation is the norm in many social groups. Partnerships can be monogamous, serial, or concurrent. Identity formation is characterized by who am I as a vocational person? Interests diverge and energy is channeled. Friendship groups depend increasingly less on proximity and more on common interests. Being the same as or not different from everybody else is a less intense need than at earlier stages. Teens achieve majority and thus autonomy at age 18. In U.S. and Western society in general, continued reliance on parents and the family is typical until the early to middle 20s. It is essential to remember, however, that health care decisions can only be made with the fully informed consent of the adolescent. As we watch Tanya and Zach tell their stories, we will hear the differences in experience the patient can have depending on whether he or she is 13 or 16 at diagnosis. The age differential may almost seem inconsequential, but it is actually a major factor in how the patient and family and friendship groups approach the diagnosis and treatment of potentially life-threatening condition. It is also fully reflected in how they have incorporated that experience into their lives now as young adults. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Gabrielle Roberts, and I'm a child psychologist at Advocate Children's Hospital in Chicago. And in my section, I'll be speaking about the challenges faced by adolescents fighting cancer, how they cope, and how child life specialists can support them. The information in this presentation is based on existing research, in addition to occasional anecdotal input from my own experience. Letting yourself go through 
the range of emotion can be can be useful in getting to the other side. Well, for me, some people that really helped me uh, get through my cancer experience, similar to Tanya and hopefully you know other kids have the same experience. It's really my family, really just a huge support network. I was diagnosed. I was 13 and spent the next two weeks in the hospital and subsequent weeks after that admitted and I never went a single night without one of my parents sleeping over. Someone was always there with me in the hospital, which, which meant a lot to me as, you know, as a young teenage kid. And also I had a younger brother and sister, and so my aunt and uncle, they watched them for a couple weeks, and my grandparents came down, and they cooked meals, and they, again, watched my brother and sister. So it was really just a huge joint effort, and I think, too, that you know, I was going through something very unique and, you know, scary, but my parents and my family did a good job of really keeping us together uh, and making sure my younger sister and my siblings weren't neglected as well. So I would say far and away my family was, was really what helped me get through the experience. So you'll notice throughout my presentation that I have little quotes peppered in here and there. And just like listening to the video and hearing the, the words of people who've actually gone through this experience, I like to try to incorporate the actual words of those about whom I'm speaking, because the individuals themselves, as you've seen, can, in sometimes very few words, best articulate the feelings behind the experience. Sorry, this slide is sticking. Shelby, if you can advance that, I'm stuck. Before we delve into the what and how of coping, I want to touch briefly on the importance of this topic and actually the increasing complexity of what it means for teens to cope with cancer. Of course, there's the obvious. Teenagers dealing with a life-threatening illness will, to say the least, experience a range of challenges, and our understanding of those challenges and how to address them enables us to better or at least make more comfortable the difficult course of cancer treatment. The added complexity is that as science pushes forward and continues to find new cures, life-prolonging treatments, and palliative approaches, we as care providers are not only following more teens into survival, but we're also helping more teens who are simply living a lot longer with their illness. With these advances, so comes increased uncertainty about the future, and as Barrison points out, a longer period of time to contemplate the reality that they're facing. So, it's never been more important than now to try to understand what it is that our teens are dealing with and how to best help them during this exceptionally complicated time in their lives. You'll notice, by the way, that I often use phrases like try to help or try to understand, and this is very purposeful because I believe that one of the key components to providing good care and support is at the very core to recognize that we do not and cannot fully understand what it feels like to be the teen facing cancer. Even those professionals who are themselves cancer survivors, while they have a better understanding than those of us who are not survivors, still don't know how it feels to be a particular patient because, of course, every individual is unique and every individual will experience things through their own unique lens. That being said, we do, of course, have research that helps us understand common themes of stress or difficulty faced by teen fighters and that's largely, largely what will be presented today. But as I said, it's important to always bear in mind that each individual is unique and will experience their own combination of emotions and stressors in their own way. So to quickly transition from what OJ just presented in the previous segment, I include this slide just as an illustration of the contrast between a teen undertaking the normal adolescent developmental tasks and one who is fighting cancer in the context of being a teenager. So in this contrast, the teen with cancer is prevented from fully or sufficiently partaking in the important adolescent task of focusing on social relationships outside the home and finding increased independence. If you go back to Erickson and his stages of psychosocial development, if you remember that from school, um, the basic conflict faced by an adolescent is that of identity versus role confusion. So think about it. As a teen who's limited in engaging in those typical developmental tasks like friends, increased time away from parents, things that go on in school, romantic relationships. How will this impact your sense of self or your sense of individuation? How might this affect your emotions and your self-esteem? Unfortunately, in the teen with, 
teen with cancer versus teen paradigm, cancer largely wins. The teen with cancer cannot, even for a moment, be the teen without cancer. Of course, this is not to say that the teen with cancer does not ultimately resolve the conflict of this stage, um, but that he or she has to do so in a far different way than his or her peers. And doing something differently or being different as a teenager can, in and of itself, as we all know, be extremely stressful and isolating. Oops, I'm having trouble advancing again, if you can do that. So let's start from the beginning and examine some of the common challenges faced by teens at diagnosis. Actually, wait, hold on. <laughs> let's go back even further to the time in the hospital before diagnosis. What's going on during this time? The teen may have come into the hospital feeling very ill, or maybe he or she came in for something that seemed relatively minor, and surprise, he or she is now being held for tests. Time leading up to diagnosis can be very distressing. The individual is stuck in the hospital, usually an unfamiliar and not particularly comfortable place. He or she is probably hooked up to machines, is therefore restricted in movement, and has probably already experienced some pain from various tests, in addition to many physical symptoms. The teen is away from home, away from friends and comfort, meeting a ton of people he or she never wanted to meet, and is seeing other sick kids and teens in the hospital. The teen and caregivers are waiting, maybe scared, not knowing what's wrong, and not knowing what's going to happen. This presentation will focus mainly on the teen patient. However, the impact of diagnosis and overall treatment on caregivers, family, and siblings is of great importance, both in terms of how they cope as individuals and how their actions impact the teen's ability to cope in a healthy way. So helping caregivers cope and helping siblings cope could be two additional presentations on their own, and so I don't have time to cover those topics in depth today. However, it's important and will be referenced throughout the presentation to remember that our teen fighter does not exist in a bubble and is significantly impacted by the people in his or her environment. Additionally, diagnosis itself can greatly impact family dynamics and the parent-teen relationship, which, um, as OJ mentioned and as we know, could already be strained just by virtue of um, the teen being a teen and parents being parents. Can you advance that again, please? To that point, um, this next slide, which I hope will pop up in a moment. Shelby, can you, thank you. Um, is just a visual representation. This slide is just a visual representation to illustrate the complexity and process of coping. So it's not meant to represent any specific model of coping, nor is it a complete list of the infinite factors that affect coping. It's simply an example of how an individual may cope with diagnosis in the context of his or her own life circumstances. So you see the teens in the middle, or how the teen copes is in the middle, um, and his or her ability to cope and style of coping is affected by a variety of life factors. Um, so for each individual, there will be certain factors that are more prominent than others, and there's a bi-directional relationship between factors, implying that the factors not only affect the individual, but affect each other as well. And again, this isn't any particular model, but I just happen to be very visual and sort of like to put on paper what I'm trying to describe, so I hope it's helpful. Um, so in this, for example, in this, um, the actions of the treatment team are likely to affect the caregiver's response to diagnosis and the teen's approach to coping. And in turn, the way a teen copes and the reaction of caregivers will influence, at least in part, how the treatment team responds or reacts. So all of these things in turn can affect how well the teen copes with this new scary situation. Um, when I say family functioning on there, that includes SES, uh, family socioeconomic status, family social support, and the degree of family cohesion versus conflict. Um, all of these things have been shown to be correlated with how caregivers cope with a new serious diagnosis. So um, listed here are what research has found to be common emotional and behavioral responses in teens diagnosed with cancer. Anecdotally, these are also common themes that I see in my practice with this population. It's common for teens to feel anger and sadness regarding time away from school, friends, activities. Um, before the impact of a new diagnosis may set in, I find a lot of teens are just frustrated and angry about being in the hospital and the instant limitations that have been placed on their lives. Not to mention, these emotions are all set on a backdrop of physical pain, fatigue, discomfort. Um, and it's not uncommon for teens to not fully internalize the impact of diagnosis right away 
and consequently to feel confident that they can handle it. This isn't a bad thing, and in fact, it can be an emotionally protective factor during a time when the team and family are struggling to absorb a ton of new and very scary information. At the same time, in my practice, I've seen many teens who, despite feeling extremely worried, don't let on to family that they're feeling worried in order to protect their parents. So this is definitely something to look out for. As noted on the slide, um, it should also not be overlooked that as early as diagnosis, teens may start to worry about the possibility of death, whether they voice it or not. And the presence or degree of this worry might depend upon many factors, such as the type of diagnosis, how the diagnosis is delivered, how the family responds, and previous associations with cancer. So maybe they have a grandmother or family friend who died of cancer, and this is what they think of when they think of cancer. As I said before, um, I won't have much time today to spend on caregivers, but I did want to put a quick slide up to highlight some of the emotional and behavioral responses found to be common in parents or caregivers, just because as I mentioned earlier, teens don't exist in a bubble, and so care for the whole family is very important in order to help the teen. Um, we know from research that shock is a very common response. Nobody is ever prepared for this. Based on their own experiences with cancer, they might feel like their child will die. Um, parents often describe feeling numb or like they were hit over the head. They might report feeling confused and unable to hear, or remember, or think clearly when the doctors are speaking with them. Um, at the same time, they might feel guilty that their child is sick. They may feel like they did something wrong to cause this or that it was their fault or that they didn't catch it sooner. And in my experience, this is a, a really common one. Um, many of the parents spend a lot of time trying to figure out what they did wrong, if they had just come in a day earlier, what might have been different. And sometimes you'll also find that caregivers kind of seem to be in denial. Their, their teen might not look very sick. Um, they might feel that there may be a mistake. They might question the doctors or the treatment team, the reputation of the treatment team. Um, and all of these things, shock and denial, and, and can be protective in a way because they can slow down the process of really um, emotionally processing what's going on and enable them to sort of be numb to that and make the decisions that they have to make early on. And in the case of, of denial, it might prompt the family to make to look for a second opinion, which is never a bad thing. So once past the initial phase of diagnosis, there's the task of coping during treatment. Depending on the diagnosis and treatment course, this phase varies in length. It also varies greatly in structure. So for example, some teens may spend a lot of time in the hospital, whereas others may receive the bulk of their treatment through the outpatient clinic. Some may go to school, some may be out for the full course of treatment. Some may be extremely physically ill for extended periods of time, and others will more quickly be able to resume some of their more normal hobbies and activities and so on. So given all this, there are huge differences with respect to the challenges faced by teens during treatment. However, there are still some common themes with respect to how teens cope and some research findings that help us understand types of coping and their influence on teens with cancer. Overall, there's substantial research that tells us that how teens cope during treatment affects their emotional and social functioning after cancer. Of course, there isn't one right way to cope or one model for how to tell someone how to cope, but we do know um, that it's important to find healthy ways to cope throughout treatment. So really briefly, one well-validated model for coping that I think offers a good framework for our understanding is that of approach and avoidance-oriented coping described by Roth and Cohen. And this framework is based on the premise that coping with stress is, is a dynamic process, meaning that it changes over time for each individual, and that the individual may engage in approach techniques or those strategies that are oriented towards the threat, and avoidance techniques, those oriented away from the threat. So in talking about our teens with cancer, examples of approach-oriented strategies might include therapeutic techniques such as relaxation, expressing feelings, learning to take an alternate perspective or to think differently about a, a stressful situation, um, planning positive activities, spending time with or talking to friends, and asking questions to learn about treatment or to prepare for a procedure. Avoidance-oriented strategies would include techniques like distraction, declining to speak about the treatment and instead focusing on other things, um, and maybe choosing not to be a part of, of stressful conversations with doctors. So, 
the model suggests that there are both costs and benefits to both approaches. And um, the, it suggests that an ideal coping strategy would involve both approaches, such that a person can both move forward and take action, and also at the same time protect him or herself from emotional overload. So I kind of like to think of it like a basketball team playing offense and defense in order to win. So this looks different for everybody, and everybody will use these strategies in different combinations, but I mention it because I think it's helpful to have a framework for how to conceptualize how our teen patients are coping and to understand and be open-minded about the usefulness of different coping strategies, some of which might appear to others on the care team or to parents as non-productive. And you, so you might find it helpful to keep this framework in mind as we discuss how teens cope and in your work with teens fighting cancer. So in order to talk about coping during treatment, I want to quickly touch on some of the most frequently cited sources of stress and distress for teens throughout the treatment process. So these include pain and discomfort associated with treatment-related procedures and things like that. Um, research on children with cancer has demonstrated that the procedures that are part of the cancer treatment are often perceived to cause more distress than the actual diagnosis of cancer. I don't know um, from a research standpoint if this holds true for teenagers, but I think that in some cases it's a distinct possibility. And either way, in my practice, I've found that procedures and the aftermath of procedures like pain and soreness are a source of stress for teens. Other common stresses include coping with physical changes like hair loss, changes in weight, limitations to mobility, and a decrease in energy level, limitations to social life and relationship like um, changes to social routine, isolation from peers, and in some cases teasing and bullying, loss of independence, and low self-esteem. In terms of the emotional functioning of teens fighting cancer, the data is mixed. So most studies show that the majority of teens with cancer do not exhibit clinically significant levels of depression or anxiety, although some do. That said, it's largely believed that teens may experience symptoms of depression and anxiety at different points during treatment or throughout their entire treatment course. I've listed on the slide some common emotional challenges for teens during treatment. In addition to the changes in lifestyle and social isolation that we know pose challenges to many teens facing cancer, the emotional isolation of being alone with one's experience or the feeling of, you know, nobody understands how I feel is in my professional experience a huge source of emotional distress for teens. This is a terrible way for anybody to feel, but as we know, adolescence is a time when it is especially important to fit in and feel like others making this feeling especially, or I think uniquely, distressing for teens. Generally connected to the emotions that teens are experiencing are behaviors that may manifest at some time during treatment. Some of the more common be behaviors include problems with attention and concentration, defiance or oppositionality, irritability, increased sensitivity, withdrawal or clinginess, crying, treatment noncompliance, and school refusal. So these behaviors are not only connected to the emotions experienced by the teen patient, but if you think back to the list of common stressors that we just looked at a few minutes ago, you can probably draw some connections between some of those concerns and these behaviors as well. So for example, a teen may not want to go to school due to concerns about appearance and being different, or a teen may not want to take a steroid medication due to the side effects that cause changes to appearance. Okay. Now that we've covered common sources of distress in teens from diagnosis through treatment, it's time to move on to the last section of this segment and examine how child life specialists can best support teens coping with cancer. Supporting parents is obviously an important piece of the puzzle because parents or caregivers play an integral role in the support of their teen, and so the better the caregivers are managing, the better equipped they will be to support their teen. The literature is actually limited on the direct relationship between parent stress and teen stress, but clinically, I find that, at the very least, it can be extra distressing to patients when parents are not managing well. And so helping parents seems as though it would at least decrease the amount of additional stress that would be placed on the teen. Um, with respect to siblings, research shows that those siblings with more social support were less likely to exhibit symptoms of anxiety and depression or behavior problems. Thus, sibling support is obviously another very important role of the child life specialist. Siblings are often overlooked. And like the teen with cancer, siblings also often have to grow up faster than they should. And sibling support programs like SuperSibs 
are an excellent way to offer support and a sense of community to the siblings of our teen cancer patients. Oh, and one quick note, the reason for the bulldog on this slide <laughs> is because from my perspective as a psychologist in the hospital, one of the key roles of child life specialists in the hospital is to be, in essence, the watchdog for the patient. As a child life specialist, you have no agenda other than to find the best way to support the patient, which is great. <laughs> this often means looking out um, and advocating for the teen's best interest, even when it may not be what the rest of the healthcare team or the parents want to hear. In the case of coping, child life specialists are often in a position of helping others take altern alternate perspectives on a request or a behavior and helping to meet the teen's needs whenever possible. I know it can be hard to speak up, and I know that input is not always welcome, but I encourage you to always find a way to help the patient's voice be heard, especially when it's getting lost. So what does it mean for child life specialists to provide support? As we already discussed, support means different things for different people. Therefore, it's crucial that plans for support be individually tailored to each patient. Also remember that the type of support or intervention that a teen needs or responds to is likely to evolve through the treatment process. So any assessment or evaluation of needs may be just a snapshot for that period of time. And so it's important to frequently reevaluate to see if the teen's needs have changed. I'm sure many of you who work with teens in any capacity have experienced the phenomenon of coming up with a great plan and then a day later it no longer feels like a good fit to the teen. Also, I think it's easy for many of us who work with a lot of teen cancer patients to feel like our past experiences allow us to understand a current patient or that one patient, because he or she is similar to another patient, must be feeling or thinking the same thing. Well, in some cases, this may be true. And clearly, past experience does help us to work with future patients. But you just have to be careful. The way I'd like to think about it for myself is that I try to be strengthened but not handicapped by past experience. And also, don't be afraid to fail. A lot of what we do with teens is trial and error. Sometimes you have to try or suggest many different strategies or ideas and just see which ones stick, and that's okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. With respect to specific strategies for helping teens to cope, the next few slides will highlight some of what I consider and what research has demonstrated to be important principles in helping teens cope. The number one most important, if you do nothing else strategy, listen. This is an integral part of working with teens in general and the only way that you're going to have any chance of breaking through to them. When you listen, make no assumptions. Take what the teen is saying at face value, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Chances are there is something important in there and you will figure it out eventually if you're patient and open-minded. Teens are used to feeling ignored and dismissed and as soon as they sense that you're, quote, acting like all the other grown-ups, or assuming that you understand, you're done. Equally important to what you hear is what you see. When you're with the adolescent, be observant. Notice problematic or concerning interactions between the teen and the treatment team. Notice what things appear to be calming to the teen, what things appear to lead to increased emotional distress or behavior change. In my experience, I often find that some of the best support I give comes from obser observing a teen's reaction to something said or done. So in these cases, I might question the teen when we're one-on-one, -on -one, or I might ask a question about it in front of the teen, like maybe to the doctor, as though it's my question, but with the suspicion that it's an issue that needs to be brought to the surface. In this way, I can facilitate communication about something that may be of concern. Teens don't always feel empowered to ask questions and don't always have the words to do so. And so that's where experience combined with listening and observation can really benefit you being an advocate and support for the teen patient. Of course, this is also where individually tailored support and knowing your teen patient really comes into play. For some, more information can ease anxiety, while for others, it causes stress and makes them think about something they're trying not to think about that day. Be mindful of your patient and his or her unique needs. Space is a great example of this. For some teens, one of the best things you can do for them is to kick everyone out of the room and give them space. Um, maybe they're afraid to ask for that because they don't want to hurt feelings of family who've been so supportive. And for other teens, feeling alone being alone feels lonely, and it would be important to help them plan for things to do during periods when they will be without company. I also want to mention here that sometimes the best way to provide support is just to validate the feelings that the teen is having. As we heard Tanya say in the video, in the video clip, um, telling a teen that it's normal and okay to have feelings of anger, depression, worry is very powerful. When people are hurting emotionally, our instinct is often to try to fix it 
to immediately raise their spirits or to solve the problem. And sometimes you just have to say, yes, I know you're feeling depressed. This sucks. I don't blame you. Of course, that doesn't mean that you can't go on to try to help them find a way to feel better. But sometimes the most powerful intervention is just the acknowledgement. And as challenging as it is, it's important to help other treatment team members and family members be OK with this, too. I put create, um, help to create predictability on here because it cannot be ignored as an important tenet of supporting the teen battling cancer. That being said, I know from personal experience that child life specialists are expert in this um, and that you guys um, are really good at, it's one of the key ways that you do support teens and help them cope. Um, even the team that wants nothing to do with you will generally benefit and appreciate the creation of schedules, preparation for changes, and, and things like that. Um, of course, they're teens, so bear in mind that you may not always know you're appreciated. I generally feel that by simply listening and respecting the request of the teen, I'm at least minimally appreciated. Even if the request is to leave, I may be the only one who respected that request all day. And this is an advantage to being a child life specialist as well. You don't have an agenda other than to provide support. You don't have to meet with them. If all you do each day or each time you try to visit is to give them one thing that they can say no to that day, then you've given them something that, that's important that day. That is an intervention in and of itself, and that is helping the team to cope in those moments. So don't forget that, and remember to pay attention to the power of small gestures like that. Helping to maintain normalcy is another key aspect of supporting teens fighting cancer. The literature suggests that encouraging teens and families to maintain normal routines, or at least something similar to how they used to be before cancer, or to engage in social activities, um, can really help with psychological health. In my experience, taking the time out when they can do something normal can be very restorative and can give them energy and motivation for the next phase of treatment. Many of the important interventions that you can offer as a child life specialist are not just those things you do while the patient's in the hospital or at the clinic, but also the things that you encourage them to do when they're away from the hospital. And having days or hours when they're feeling a little better to do something more energetic, you know, encouraging them to do that can make a big difference. Empowering teens to find ways to have some sense of control and to take a role in decision making can be a very important part of supporting teens during their treatment. For any individual, the process of fighting an illness like cancer can be very disempowering. There are very few decisions that you're able to make for yourself, and these decisions that you are given do not generally consist of pleasurable options. Um, so this feeling of disempowerment can hit teenagers especially hard, as this is the time they're supposed to be taking more control in their lives. For many teens, finding even small ways to help them feel that they have some sense of control can be very therapeutic. I find that there are always ways to find control. Sometimes you have to be really creative, but there are ways. This might be an instance where you have to speak up and appeal to other members of the treatment team to work with you to provide options for the team. With respect to strategies, helping the team to identify what helps them to cope and encouraging or reminding them to use those coping skills are key. Sometimes the team may already have a number of, of things that he or she can do that help. Um, usually there's still a thing or two that you can think of to suggest that will supplement their coping skills toolkit. I always tell all my teens that it's important to have a whole toolkit of coping skills to pick from. The thing that helps today might not work tomorrow, and you may have to pull out something else. The more you have to choose from, the better prepared you are to cope. As a child life specialist, you can help teens grow their supply of coping skills by teaching them new things and helping them to identify new ways to help themselves. One thing I frequently do with teens, and it comes from my background in cognitive behavioral therapy, is pleasurable activity planning. It sounds really simple. But as you know, often when we're feeling really crummy, it's hard to think of or plan for enjoyable things to do. So making a plan to do something fun or pleasurable can almost force them to enjoy even a small part of the day, and that might be the only good part of the day. Finally, make referrals. Try to think about what the team might need or from what he or she might benefit. Of course, if you su suspect that the teen is suffering from depression or anxiety, consult the psychologist at the hospital or ask the psychologist or social worker for community resources for the family. If your hospital has expressive therapies like art therapy or music therapy, ask the therapist to stop by and encourage the team to give it a try. I find that referrals for these types of services are often forgotten by other members of the treatment team. And so I rely on child life specialists to think about and utilize all of the hospital resources available to our team patients. 
In closing, you've probably noticed that a lot of what I talked about today has more to do with process than with product or specific strategies. That's because I find the actual product or strategies so much less important than the process or how they're carried out. There are really no limits on what works with teams, but without good sort of guidelines for how to think about and approach the coping strategies and the team, you're less likely to be successful and more likely to miss the important details. And of course, although this is incredibly stressful work, try to have fun with it sometimes. It's a privilege to be led into the worlds of these teens and to be able to support them through a horrible ordeal like cancer. Oh, I can, can advance to the... Hi, my name is Tui Trin, and I am a child life specialist at the Children's Cancer Hospital at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I have been working with adolescents with cancer for a little over five years now. We begin the school reentry topic with a video clip of Zach and Tanya sharing their experiences and feelings regarding their school reintegration process. Well, one thing I think that didn't help me may not have been a direct result of any of the chemo or but as turning 13 and, and being in eighth grade it was and losing my hair I was bald and I was on a lot of steroids so I was you know much chunkier than I normally would be and so I think it was it was a difficult transition going back to school I missed a lot of school sort of that first half of eighth grade I was diagnosed that summer and it wasn't so much to me, nothing much had changed. I was still the same person in my mind. I maybe couldn't do the, the physical activity that I wanted to, but it was sort of the reaction from my classmates and my peers that didn't necessarily know, you know, how to react to sort of what I looked like. And uh, the teachers did a good job of trying to include me, but that was difficult sort of to, to process as, a, as an eighth grader where, you know, all you're used to is your friends interacting with you and like nothing's changed, but for them they just don't know how uh, to react and it's not necessarily their fault. And you know, looking back, any eighth grade kid would not know how to, to deal with that. So I think that was difficult for me. And you know, looking back, um, you know, I'm not sure I could have done anything differently, but it's definitely given me some good perspective on uh, kids now that I look at that are that are in school. You know, it was mostly a combination of the faculty at my school. It was sort of a small school environment to begin with, and the teachers knew me because I came up through that school for many, many years, and so I was kind of on the last, I was in eighth grade, so I'd been there for six or seven years, so they they knew me for who I was, and as this, you know, energetic kid that, you know, was always involved in things and got good grades, and so it was really a joint effort between my parents and the faculty that I think made the transition as easy as possible. And, and I should say that the kids, my classmates were great. I think just the relationship shifted a little bit. Not that people were mean or um, bullies or anything. It was just that they didn't necessarily know how to react. So I didn't have anyone help me transition back to school. My mom was a huge advocate for me. I could never have done it without her. Mm -hmm. But um, there was no official person at either at my high school or the hospital that helped me transition. That was a huge gap. It caused a lot of issues for me. And there was a lot of variability across my classes. So when I was in high school, I was taking you know, six classes at a time and had six different teachers. And they all handled it differently. And this was a pretty big stress on my family. Um, I dealt with some of it, but my parents really dealt with a lot of it. And I had some instructors who would penalize me for not being in class. Um, some who said, just we'll let the student go. It doesn't matter. There was really no, um, no one to help structure that transition, which was a really hard thing and something that I think uh, we need better support systems. You know, liaisons between hospitals and high schools, guidance counselors, someone who will be a point person to help, you know, be the front line for the kids with cancer. Because I didn't like going into my classes on the first day of school the next year and saying, I have cancer, <laughs> I'm on treatment, I may have to miss classes. That was actually really emotionally stressful for me and it would have been good to have um, a, a clear person that I could turn to for that. And it all turned out fine. I, you know, took some classes at the independent high school and took some college courses. 
the tutoring made up for my work and I graduated on time and everything. But not everyone does and that's okay. Um, if you don't graduate on time or you need a, you know, an extra semester, if you want to take a gap year or whatever it is. But I think there do need to be more resources for um, teenagers in terms of the transition between being hospital and being Tanya and Zach expressed many challenges and hardships during their school reentry process. These challenges included difficulties with peer interactions, having multiple teachers without consistent expectations, and not enough resources or support. School provides a place where adolescents' need for socialization and academic development are met. When an adolescent is diagnosed with cancer, the school reentry piece should start right from the beginning. Helping parents and patients understand the educational laws and ways to help maintain communication and support with the school can really help transition the patient back into the school system when the medical team advises that they are ready to do so. Children who have been through the cancer treatment may experience some short-term or long-term effects that may contribute to learning disabilities. There are three federal laws that are available to help and protect patients who may need educational assistance. The individuals with Disability Education Act, or IDEA, is a law ensuring that all public schools, colleges, and universities provide a free and appropriate education. IDEA requires that all children ages 3 through 21 must be tested to qualify for special education services. The testing must reveal a cognitive defect, a deficit in order to qualify for an Individualized Education Plan, or an IEP. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is a national law that protects qualified individuals from discrimination based on their disability. There is no specific mention of learning disabilities in Section 504. However, the law defines a person as disabled if he or she has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activities. Under Section 504, no cognitive deficit has to be demonstrated in order to qualify for accommodations. Under this Act, accommodations must be made to assist the child. These accommodations may include extended time for taking tests, having lectures recorded, modifications in academic requirements and expectations, laminated hall passes for frequent bathroom breaks, and so forth. The educational booklet Learning and Living with Cancer, Advocating for Your Child's Educational Needs includes more examples of accommodations, and you may find this at livestrong.org. The Americans with Disability Act of 1990, or ADA, prohibits discrimination and ensures equal opportunity for persons with disability in employment, state and local government services, public accommodations, commercial facilities, and transportation. ADA ensures that a disabled person has the same opportunities as a non-disabled person. This includes availability of handicapped spaces, elevator access, and so forth. And again, for um, more information regarding these laws and acts, you can contact the National Dissemination Center for Children with Disability. So it is important to remember that the school needs as much support as the adolescent and family through this process. Communication is key in facilitating a smooth transition back into the school community. At the beginning of diagnosis, the school reentry team should initiate a meeting with school personnel. This should include teachers, principals, counselors, school nurse, or, or in, and anyone that is involved in interacting with the adolescent. This initial meeting is to provide diagnosis education, assessment of understanding to clear up any mis misconceptions, and to establish a need for a 504 accommodation plan or an IEP. You can also provide hospital contact numbers and it's also helpful during this meeting to identify a primary contact person or liaison to communicate information. And this is extremely helpful because the adolescents may have multiple teachers. If meeting with the school is not physically possible, perhaps video conferencing or sending a letter could be an alternative. Updating the school frequently regarding the adolescent's prognosis and needs is critical. A tool that families can use is a communication book 
This notebook can be passed along through a trusted family friend or liaison. Another tool to encourage frequent communication is through a secured group email. Through the use of group email, the adolescent, family, or liaison would only have to send out one communication email to provide updates and notifications to all. There are resources available for teachers to provide education regarding cancer and how to support cancer survivors. Live Strong at School is a free program that provides lesson plans, videos, and worksheets for all grade levels. The Trish Green Back to School program provides informa information, videos, and programs to help explain to classmates and teachers about cancer, treatment, side effects, and ways to provide support. With adolescents, peer acceptance and support weighs heavily on their ability to reintegrate into the school system smoothly. The adolescents' peers and classmates need an opportunity to openly discuss the illness and have their questions answered. Because of the probability that the adolescents' classmates have misconceptions regarding cancer, treatment, and side effects, a school presentation would highly be beneficial. Before this step is taken, it is helpful to inquire with the patient and their family whether or not they would like for this to occur, and if the patient would like to be present for the presentation. Some families may prefer that a presentation is not necessary, and may prefer other methods to increase peer support. When conducting a presentation, issues to address should include diagnosis education, causes of cancer, um, and particularly important to address that it's not contagious, side effects, changes in appearance, school attendance, and suggestions for support. Some suggestions for support include sending cards, making banners for the patient's hospital room, video recording, taking a field trip to the hospital, sending a care package, or just being there and maintaining open communication. And that can be calling, texting, and through other social media. It is also important to encourage the patient to support their peers as well. The patient can create a video demonstrating what a typical day at the hospital is like for them and to share it with their peers. Often peers are unsure on what to say or how to treat the patient. The patient can write a letter to address the elephant in the room, reassure their friends that they are the same person, encourage them to ask questions, and let their peers know that how they would like to be treated. By encouraging the patient to take an active role in providing support for their peers, this will also give the patient an opportunity to own their own illness. With the help of the child life specialist, the specialist can assist or coach the patient on how to answer difficult or uncomfortable questions. It is helpful to invite a survivor who has been through the process of reintegration back into the school system and present their experiences and tips. There are many methods of communications that are available in today's society. Guiding the adolescent in identifying the ones that they feel most protected and comfortable in using is best. Discuss with the patient on how much information they would like to share and the preferred method of providing information to their peers. Social media sites, such as Facebook, allows you to create private groups that you can share updates and status to the seclu secluded group. If social media is not a comfortable route for the patient, Google Groups is an invitation-only listserv that the patient can use to maintain communication. While social media sites and email may never substitute for the presence of close friends, it can certainly assist in a method of remaining connected. Parents play an essential role in the school reintegration process, but parents may be anxious about the child's return into the classroom. With proper guidance and support, parents can help the transition. It is critical to discuss with the parents and explore their feelings and concerns regarding the patient returning to school. Is there hesitation because they want to protect their child? By identifying the parent's concern, the specialist can assist with developing a plan, creating an emergency contact list, and coordinating a meeting with the school to alleviate the parent's anxiety. Parents know their child best, and by providing education and resources, it will empower the parents to be strong advocates for their child. 
it is important to utilize resources and people within your hospital to create a multidisciplinary approach to the school reintegration process. There may already be a school reentry coordinator, psychologists, social workers, and other members of the healthcare team in place that can address several of the areas of the school reentry process. And remember, the school re reintegration is a process that really should begin at diagnosis and continue through survivorship. So life after treatment. The cancer journey for patients can be long and difficult. Due to treatment side effects, it may be difficult for patients to return back to their normal routine prior to the cancer diagnosis. Specialists can assist with helping the patient understand that there might be a new normal. The patient's new normal may include making changes in the way they eat, getting around due to physical changes, and sources of support. For adolescents who may be entering college or the workforce, it is helpful for the patient to seek support through vocational and career counseling services, either through the college or hospital. Vocational counselors can help the students apply for disability services and identify accommodations to support academic success. Here is a list of frequently requested educational accommodations. By talking to a career counselor, the patient can assess if their career goals prior to the cancer diagnosis are still attainable. If the prior goals are no longer an option, the career counselor can perform a career assessment test to identify other areas of interest, patient strengths and weaknesses, and to assist the patient in identifying a new career goal. These services are available at no charge in most colleges and hospitals. Cancerandcareers.org and DARS has more information and resources for cancer survivors entering the workforce. All right, thanks Twee and, and Bree and OJ. Um, I, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jason Kanner, and I'm a pediatric hematology oncology physician in the Chicagoland area, uh, most often at Advocate Children's Hospital. Um, as the other segments have done, my segment will start uh, with a brief, uh, back with our survivors with a brief interview. So let's Well, for me, my personal experience, you know, people talk about, you know, issues of fertility or relationships, and, you know, that wasn't from where I was when I was diagnosed, in my experience, that wasn't necessarily something that was preoccupying my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, for my parents, I think they were really concerned about the procedures and the protocols, and, but for me, it was more kind of the day-to-day, -day, everyday life kind of thing. So I was, again, very active and also sports. So I was very concerned about, you know, am I going to be able to play on the baseball team? Am I going to be able to, on a Friday night, sit in a crowded movie theater with my friends, even though my, you know, white blood cell count's low and I could be susceptible to uh, infection? So I think one thing, I had a core catheter, um, but it was underneath the skin. And just one quick anecdote, you know, one of the attendings, one of the top physicians suggested that I get the one like a Broviac is called, which is outside the skin. Mm -hmm. And so my parents, they just, you know, you listen to the doctors and they, and you kind of take their advice. So I was a very active kid and, you know, I wanted to continue to do that. So one of the young fellows really recommended, really overruled the attending uh, and was sort of later admonished, but I'm really glad that he stood up for me and stood up for my parents and I ended up getting the internal uh, port. And so I was still able to swim, I was able to play baseball, I'm not as well as I was before, but that would have changed the entire landscape of my cancer treatment and experience, and so I think that's one thing is to really look at, you know, the individual and what, what they're trying to do, not just, you know, put them into a category. My advice for medical professionals who are working with teens with cancer is to treat them as you would an adult, um, unless uh, they suggest otherwise. Um, but to start out by treating them as an adult and also taking their feedback, opinions, and their 
reports of their own illness seriously. Um, I had several times when I was taking a, a new drug, which is now quite well known to give uh, people migraines, and it was pretty new at the time, and when I was taking it, I had horrible migraines, and I came in and would tell my doctors this, and they, because it was a new drug, they didn't know it, and they didn't always believe me, and so I didn't get um, pain medication to help with it, mm -hmm. and that was the time when it was, it was pretty hard, and I suffered a lot, um, and now they routinely give pretty good pain medication and um, resources for that drug, um, but at the time, they would tell my mom, I think she's just having a hard time and not feeling well and feeling depressed, um, and that actually wasn't the case, so take um, teens' reports of their own bodies seriously and treat them like adults and um, don't come in before seven in the morning. <laughs> So as all of us um, who are presenting to, to you today um, agree, we, you know, we definitely want to thank both of our, our survivors for their, their input here. Um, what I think, um, what we do know as healthcare professionals is that uh, working with pediatric patients with cancer, inclusive, inclusive of the adolescent population, uh, can be very trying and has uh, an effect on all of us. Um, throughout our career. What's nice, or what should be uh, taken, at least within this part of the presentation from, from our survivors, is that uh, we, we should recognize some of the great things that we do for our patients, and often remember those when we're having difficult days or when we're having difficult times um, treating and working with patients and their families. The okay, sorry. Um, as of now, we know that the demands in healthcare have become increasingly more intense due to multiple changes, inclusive of the advances in science, media, internet, and more things. Specifically, some of the things that are increasing um, these demands include the expanding complexity of medical care. Uh, the increase in patient acuity, especially within the hospitalized patients, the heightened patient and family expectations with easier access to the internet, um, better or more inclusive diagnosis and treatment descriptions, and the ability to have conversation with friends and family who may even have some medical knowledge of their own. Additionally, technological advances um, have led to an increased requirement to develop sophisticated skills and thus more demand on different, uh, us as healthcare professionals. And then, as we know, there's an ongoing need to cope with morbidity and mortality of this illness. More specifically, within pediatrics, healthcare professionals have different and more uh, expanded demands. We know that we are constantly working with children, and of course, families place a different and uh, different amount of stress and demand on each and every one of us. All of us are aware that this specific population, one that everyone loves and and uh, has learned to love, whether it's in their own family or within their profession, or profession, excuse me, has a tendency to place high demands on us as we are caring for both a young child an adolescent, and a treasure to a mom, dad, or a collection of other caring family members. Additionally, uh, we are constantly working within a multidisciplinary health care team. Although positive for many reasons, this places a lot of stress and demand on each of us. This is even more heightened within the pediatric oncology unit and more so for those who work in a larger hospital or academic center. Now within, um, now, within the adolescent population specifically, we add even a deeper dimension. The demands um, on all of us become great, greater as adolescents are more aware of their illness. This can lead to more conversations and questions, or as we know, a lot less communication overall. Either way, having the p potential to cause more stress and, 
and or demands. Whether or not the patient uh, chooses to discuss these things with uh, a physician, a child life specialist, or a nurse, or whether they shut us out, uh, this can affect us every day. Adolescents also start to understand some of the long-term implications of cancer, and once again may lean on any of the healthcare professionals for support and our answers. And as mentioned uh, above, adolescents are not always open to discussing their thoughts and feelings which affect, uh, which directly affect us. Now, despite these demands, in multiple surveys, several healthcare professionals reported that their job had changed their outlook on life with the most common statement consistent with the sentiment that they try and live their own life to its fullest. Additionally stating that their job has helped them to become a better person, more open with others, more kind with other people, more compassionate, and more appreciative of life overall. Specific advantages within, within the field that were that were rewarding to healthcare professionals include family-centered care, leading to a very close and collaborative relationship with others, and an ongoing relationship with both a patient and or family. Being remembered specifically and valued, valued by patients and families that they cared for. Relationships with parents that were solidified by cooperation, trust, and openness. And as I mentioned, their job provided a great amount of fulfillment and personal growth. Now, on top of the increased amount of demands discussed in earlier slides, many stressors also exist within our field, some of which are listed here on this slide. Healthcare professionals specifically identified cancer causing distress or dis or excuse me, increased stressors causing dis when they are causing distress or discomfort to patients. Increased stress when working with children who are in pain. Difficulty when treating patients with poor prognosis. V more difficult situations such as relapse causing uh, specific stressors, specifically having to shift in a focus from an intent to cure to palliation. And as we all know um, and experience in our own uh, practice, differing opinions about medical decisions, especially when coming, um, uh, when talking about end of life and whether or not to continue therapy or not. the care that we need to provide for dying, a dying child. And then something that's more personal, difficulty of balancing home and work life. So when we discuss, uh, with, with, when we discuss healthcare professionals and we start thinking about how these stressors and demands uh, can affect us, we think about the term burnout. Now burnout is a multi-step process that's progressing slowly over time, or that usually progresses slowly over time. Unfortunately, it can affect both the individual and the oncology team as a whole. It's defined, or it's made up of multi, uh, or excuse me, multiple different parts, which include mental and physical exhaustion, where an individual or team is at the stage of feeling emotionally empty with little or no energy or desire to relate to the children, the family, or other staff members. Usually that progresses to indifference, which uh, describes an individual who may become more cynical, uncaring, or unmotivated. They often become disinterested and may demonstrate a growing bitterness. Unfortunately, in this situation, the patients tend to become more dehumanized and are treated as objects by the individual as opposed to patients. The healthcare profession then can, or the healthcare professional can then progress into a sense of failure uh, within, their within their profession 
and they start to believe that they are no longer capable of caring uh, for these important patients. This leads to more personal uh, feelings such as a failure as a person and eventually um, can push healthcare professionals to a feeling of quote unquote being dead inside. This is described in the literature as feeling numb and dead inside um, and it's not uncommon for an individual to leave the pr profession at this point. So what do we do about this and why are we discussing this? Well, it's important because we want to reach out as a group of panelists to discuss how we can hopefully prevent and provide some coping skills for all of us as healthcare professionals. First and foremost, we want to assess our own ability to work with kids, families, and their diagnosis with the goal of changing any detrimental aspects of the work environment and hopefully modifying indiv individual behavior to avoid this. Within the in workplace environment alone, or specifically, the success of this comes down to leadership and leadership activities. It's important to, do, to establish or attempt to establish common missions, goals, and objectives and be able to speak up about your, um, your specific stressors and or demands. We encourage leadership the leadership team to engage a team on um, to engage a team on a regular basis in order for the healthcare providers to be able to speak up and express themselves. We also encourage um, an environment that is uh, full of calm, support, and lack of tension, especially in a very stressful environment taking care of kids with cancer. What is most important is to try to establish support systems within our workplace environment so we can lean on each other and express ourselves in certain situations. As mentioned before, I think one of the most difficult things in taking care of these kids is that we often have uh, differing opinions when it comes to decision making regarding the patients. Thus, multidisciplinary meetings and teams are important in which we engage staff members to um, participate in this decision making and then hopefully feel better about the outcome and treatment choice. And as mentioned, I think communication amongst colleagues is one of the most important things. Also important for prevention and coping is debriefing meetings that need to occur at cri critical times. Not only does this include um, patients at the moment, or patients when they are facing end of life decisions, but also when there are transitions, whether that's a relapse, recurrence, or change in therapy. It is a uh, it is beneficial to the whole team to provide some kind of rotation within the oncology department if possible so all of us can see both the um, rewards and stressors within, within the department. We also need to take advantage of our social workers and psychologists and hope that whether they're present within each of our institutions, um, specifically on, in oncology or within the pediatric hospital uh, in general, their expert, take advantage of their expertise and lean on them to help us work through difficult moments. Some other things that um, are used regularly and can be helpful to prevent some of this, these stressors and help us cope are retreats, educational leave days, and short leaves, especially when things have been more difficult. Personally, uh, it's important, uh, I think it's important to encourage all of us starting um, 
starting from the top, to be able to approach colleagues to discuss difficult cases, not necessarily for a medical, uh, or not necessarily to discuss a medical outcome or treatment, but to get some advice or input when we're trying to deal with uh, a patient, their sibling, their family member um, in, a, in a difficult situation. Sometimes simple socialization in a staff event, whether it's um, run by the hospital or outside the hospital can be uh, quite rewarding and can help us work through our stressors. We all know that within the department, the respect and value of each other is important, and we need to um, often recognize our colleagues um, for the work that they have done and for the excellent job that they do on a day-to-day -day basis with the patients. Not only will this help uh, others, but over time, this will uh, come back to help um, each of us when we deal with these demands. Like anything, we'd want to avoid negative conversations and gossip among colleagues, as this is not going to help the situation in an already uh, potentially stressful environment. And something that um, I have touched on before is that we want to make sure that everyone within the or amongst the multidisciplinary team and throughout the healthcare team uh, is heard. We want to avoid creating a feeling of not being heard or valued, especially when taking care of a group of patients that we all are very attached to. Taking this a little further, uh, it's important to set personal limits. I think myself as a physician, and again the other panelists on the call, would encourage all of us to avoid over-involvement or overwork uh, within this field. We all know the importance of establishing our personal needs and being with our family and taking care of ourselves so we can thus take care of our patients better. It's important to keep the communication lines open, avoid gaps amongst the healthcare professional team, and be able to, uh, as mentioned, discuss different feelings and emotions. When we do um, face death amongst our patients, uh, it is important for some of us to achieve closure, whether that's a uh, debriefing or attending a funeral or, or wake. Although this is not, uh, although each of these things are not always easy for us, or have not, or are not our choice, um, this often helps with the overall feeling of uh, the overall stress that we may have with a patient's death. It's important to maintain a healthy balance between work and home life. Um, making sure that we try and spend time with our friends, our family, children of our own, um, and if that includes colleagues from work, uh, even better as that communication um, can, can be taken to those settings. There are, um, the, there are the opportunities for professional intervention and workshops um, that can often uh, work with the healthcare professionals as a whole and um, help with preventing uh, this, the, the stressors that come with pediatric oncology. Looking back at my experience, what I wish I would have known is that your hair grows back. People tell you that, but there's a difference between hearing it and really believing it. <laughs> your hair grows back, you'll feel better, and life will never return to normal. It will be different, but um, it will be good, and it will be beautiful, and there will be many things that you appreciate so deeply that you didn't that you could before. Um, and that this is just one of many challenges that you'll face in life, and it will give you tools to help with other hard things, whether they're big or small, like 
if you're rock climbing, you think to yourself, I can get to the top of this wall, I have cancer. Um, or if you sprain your ankle, you think, thank goodness I'm not in the hospital for several months, I'll feel better in a couple weeks. Um, it really gives you resources when you're older and you're further away from it to appreciate the world and and know that you have the strength to overcome difficult times. Looking back at my cancer experience, I can think of two sort of important things. Um, I feel fortunate I'm over 12 years now in remission and cancer-free, so you know I feel fortunate in that sense, and I know not everyone else can say that. And you know, one thing looking back, I really I was diagnosed sort of going into my teenage years, and I really looked at having cancer and having been diagnosed with cancer as a stigma. And, you know, everyone in my eighth grade class knew me, and they knew who I was before I had cancer. And so when I went into high school, my hair had grown back, but I was had almost this unfounded paranoia that, that people would find out that I had cancer and that it would define who I was, and I wouldn't be able to introduce, you know, who Zach was as a person, as an athlete, as a students, as a friend, but that they would only know me as the kid that had cancer. Um, so that was something that I really struggled with for a long time, and now, you know, looking back, I feel like I've kind of come to terms with, you know, as an adult and people that having cancer is not something that you should be ashamed of. It's something that you didn't bring on and that people ultimately sort of respect you for uh, going through that, that process. And I guess the second thing, as an adult, looking back, is that I can really I feel like I have some sort of perspective and can see a little bit more of a big picture that, you know, when I was 13 years old, most kids probably didn't have a care in the world, but, you know, now when I have a tough day at work or, you know, a tough day at home or whatever is getting me down, I can sort of look back and say, hey, you know, it's not as bad as, you know, throwing up in the morning or not being able to walk or sitting in a hospital bed when you're 13 years old. So um, I think it's made me stronger as a person and um, I feel fortunate to, to be on this end of it. Thank you all for being on the call. Um, as a wrap-up for today, we discussed um, how teens respond with many emotions uh, and behaviors to cancer treatment, uh, how child life specialists should respond to those emotions and behaviors by facilit uh, listening, facilitating communication, being an advocate, as well as being flexible and open-minded. We also discussed school reentry and life after treatment and how it can be difficult and how it's important to work with schools. Um, to support peer-to-peer -peer relationships as well as uh, support families through the transition back into school. We also learned that it's important to offer patients with options for career development and college. Uh, lastly, we learned that coping as a healthcare professional can be difficult, but it's important to ask others in your department for help and to keep good work-life balance. We open up to questions. We invite, we invite everybody to um, put their questions, uh, submit their questions. We do have one in already, and I will just comment that I know that we are almost out of time. We're going to keep the line open for a few more minutes for those who do want to ask questions and hear them. Um, and the first question, I think, really goes um, either to Gabrielle or to OJ, which is, um, would you address some of ideas for techniques we can use to help adolescents in expressing themselves? Sure. Um, uh, you want to go ahead and start, uh, Bri, and I'll chime in. Sure. Um, that's a great question, um, and that's a, that's a tough question to answer quickly. <laughs> um, but I think the, the number one thing is to be creative about finding ways to help them. And that's, I guess, what you're asking. But to think about there are so many different ways, so whether it's through talk with you, or whether it's by talking with somebody else, or whether it's through art or some other creative outlet, or whether it's more private communication like journaling. Um, there are so many different ways, and I, what's important isn't um, 
how they communicate, but it's, it's that they communicate in some way that feels important to them. So um, for me, sometimes, if, even if I'm one-on-one -on -one in conversation with someone and something's really hard for them to say, we might write back and forth. So we might write letters to each other each day. Sometimes it's, it's talk. Um, sometimes expression is, has, is nonverbal completely. So I don't know if, if that was helpful, but I think exploring with the teen what, is, what feels comfortable to them and trying a number of different things I think will help you to figure out what works best for them. I, I just want to add um, two statements. One was uh, one of our trainees in music therapy uh, used, the, uh, used the phrase, uh, this patient doesn't do verbal. And I think that really uh, underlines what you were saying, Bree, and that is that we have to find some nonverbal communication patterns for people. The other thing is that moment of crisis is a really hard time to change lifelong habits. So if you have a teenager who has never talked and it just isn't that person's style, please remember that this is not the right time to insist that they they change their way of uh, communicating with the world. Because they have been communicating, it's just been in some other way. And that, that becomes our challenge, to find out how we can best meet their needs. Thank you, OJ. That is an excellent point, and I'm really glad you made it. And just to, to add one more thing onto that, um, I just was thinking about um, one patient, or actually a few in particular, who um, I may have spent a year with meeting you know, on weekly inpatient hospital admissions and we barely talked about the cancer experience. We talked about frustrations from home, we talked about frustrations with friends, not particularly always related even to being sick, just sort of other life things and what you, to the naked eye or <laughs> to someone observing it might have appeared that we were completely avoiding the topic, but really um, by coping with and working through and focusing on other things it helped the patient to make it through the process. And as OJ said, not only is it not the time to create new habits, but it's, it's crisis, and it's not the time, you know, when we're in a crisis, we just, it's just about surviving and making it through. And so whatever helps them to survive is good, and if they don't want to exactly talk about what's going on, but are open to talking about sports, that's great. Thank you both. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, the next one, I think, Dr. Canner, is to you, which is if you could talk a little bit about how to get a coworker to deal with burnout when they don't think that they're burnt out. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question, and I, and I think that obviously um, uh, not as a, it will be difficult to answer not necessarily as a mental health professional. However, hopefully, we have good enough relationships within the oncology team to either do you know to do one of two things um, either approach this uh, probably at first gently with that colleague or be able to lean on another healthcare professional within the team maybe a social worker or a psychologist that have uh, the ability to do that basically I think what the second thing is recognizing our, our limitations uh, thus if I have a colleague that is really um, having a difficult time, uh, it, it may be time to um, um, get, uh, get someone involved that has that experience of approaching it, like, like someone like, like Bree or others who um, do it with the patients day to day. Um, that's number one. And, and you know, it, it's not always a bad thing. I've had some experiences with uh, just grabbing that colleague and saying, Hey, let's let's. Hey, do you have to be home tonight? Let's go get a bite to eat, and then slowly discussing. And sometimes I think debriefing about a day or a week is important. But it's not an easy question. I think using the skill set of your team is important. Great. Um, I think probably all of you could answer the next question just um, by topic. Bree, we'll start with you, but I would invite others to jump in. And the question is, you know, how, how do you be honest with teenagers about their limitations without crushing their spirit um, for teens who are used to being quite active? That's an excellent question. And I think the number one, as complicated or as simple as it may sound, most important thing is be honest. 
So above all else, it's, it's worse to not be honest. So as hard as it seems, be honest. There's a really, really good chance that they're already thinking the worst. So oftentimes, things that you'll actually end up telling them are better than what they were assuming. I find that that happens a lot. Um, as hard as it is, and as much as you want to not let them hit, hit bottom in terms of how they feel, you are doing them the biggest service by, by being honest. You know, I don't think you need to extrapolate and, and go on to, you know, theorize about what that might look like in the future, but I think it's important to be honest in the moment about what's going on. Honestly answer their questions to the best of your ability. If you can't answer something, I often find myself saying, you know, that's a really good question. I'm not, as the psychologist, I'm not the medical professional. Um, let me let me go. Would you like to ask, I encourage you to ask the doctor, would you like me to go ask that question? But as hard as it is, they're probably thinking it already. They've probably picked it up already from listening to conversations. So um, I think the way I would do it is I'm honest, and then the next step is focusing on what we can do about it. So here's the reality. Let's figure out how, what we can do to work around it, what, what, how we can make this a better scenario in any way. If I could just underline what Bree said, the answer of, um, or the, the concern that the child may have about what they are experiencing or what the answers to the questions are and thinking that it's worse than it really is, really, I think, covers the entire waterfront. Not, not only about what their particular illness is, but every, almost every question that they have where they felt like people have been talking around them instead of to them, uh, mm -hmm. asking them, what, what do you think is going on also? What are, what are you concerned about? Uh, and that also helps sometimes to bring the conversation down and focus it really on exactly what they're worried about. And, and then you have to be honest, just as Bree said, but, but that whole notion of um, just asking them, what, what are you concerned about? What are you thinking about? Can be a major, major step in a positive direction. Thank you, OJ. On behalf of the Child Life Council and those attending today, I would like to thank all of our presenters for this informative webinar. We appreciate you taking your time to share your knowledge with us today. Uh, I think it's all been very useful. For those child life specialists wishing to earn PDHs for this webinar, as you learned upon registration, PDHs will be earned after you have conducted a training session in your own workplace to share the information that you've learned here. Later today, you will receive an email that will include a link to the training materials, which will be based on the slides and the videos that you viewed today. Details about the documentation of your training, the timing of the training, and a quiz that you will take after you've completed your training will also be available on this website. If you have any questions about the requirements for earning PDHs, please email your questions to resources at childlife.org. Thank you to everyone who attended. We hope you'll, enjoy, you'll join us for the next webinar in this series, Critical Conversations, Discussing End of Life with Children and Families. This webinar will occur on August 14th. This ends today's webinar.